This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday edition. Today, we're talking with the co-founder of Big B Coffee, Mike McFall. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFerio. I'm your host for the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. If you haven't yet subscribed to Keys to the Shop, I would encourage you to do so just by hitting subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Also, if this show has been helpful to you and you love what we do, please give us a five-star rating or review over at iTunes. That would mean so much. Also, sharing this show with a friend or coworker or with your team is always encouraged so we can spread all this great information as far as we can into the specialty coffee community. Now, on top of doing this podcast, Keys to the Shop also offers consulting, coaching, and training for you and your business and your team. Uh, Whether that's in person or remotely, there's a lot of different ways that Keys to the Shop can help you, whether you're just starting your first coffee business or you're already established in your business and you're thinking about expanding or just leveling up your operations. I would love to have a conversation with you about how I might be able to help you in those endeavors. Uh, If you just give me an email, chris at keys to the shop.com, that's C-H-R-I-S at keys to the shop.com. It would be great to hear more about what you've got going on and how keys to the shop consulting can help you. Again, the email address is chris at keys to the shop.com. Now today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee supplies you with awesome specialty coffee equipment, you know, uh, grinders, brewers, espresso machines, even things like undercounter refrigeration. Uh, you know, purchasing equipment can be a pretty scary thing, especially when you're on a budget and you want to make sure that you're getting the right equipment for the job. Um, so Prima Coffee kind of marries the best equipment with their service and helping you get the right equipment for your circumstance. That's why I love working with them because they're dedicated to making sure you're successful with specialty coffee. So when you go to this website, prima-coffee.com, slash keys, you can get 5% off your order at checkout by using the code keys five. That's 5% off your entire order when you go to prima-coffee.com slash keys and use the code keys five at checkout. And if you're in the market for commercial equipment, I really do think you should reach out to Prima Coffee. They have a long history of doing amazing work for people just like you. Go visit them again over at prima-coffee.com slash keys. Now, today's episode is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series. The Barista Series is a world leader in plant-based performance beverages. Pacific offers oat, soy, rice, coconut, almond, and hemp. And when they launch these things, you'll know that it will perform on bar because they've designed them for the specialty coffee barista, and they've had them tested by some of the world's best baristas before you can even buy them. So you know it's going to stand up to the heat from steaming, produce awesome texture for latte art, and keep the flavor balance focused on the coffee. Your customers that love plant-based options are going to love the barista series, and I would encourage you, get this in your store and try it for yourself. Go visit them at their website, pacificfoodservice.com. I definitely think if you're going to offer your customers the best plant-based specialty coffee experience, then you should be serving the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everyone. Well, I'm really excited to have you here today. Again, we have a really great conversation with co-founder of Bigby Coffee, Mike McFall. Bigby Coffee was founded in Lansing, Michigan way back in 1995. And today is a fast-growing $100 million coffee franchise with 250-plus locations across the Midwest and quickly expanding into the East Coast in 2020. In 2011, Big B Coffee was named the fastest-growing coffee chain in America by CNBC. Having originally started with Big B in 1996 as a minimum-wage barista, Mike McFall has since held every position within the company, including his current role as the co-founder and co-CEO. Now, to Mike, uh, each one of these roles has been really crucial in allowing him to form a bond with his employees based on understanding and credibility and respect. Now, on top of leading this dynamic coffee company, Mike has also wrote and published the book Grind with the mission to help founders and entrepreneurs take their business concept and turn it into a positive cash flow business. And as you might imagine, there's a lot to talk about in this conversation with Mike. And of course, we take it right from the very beginning of how Mike went from barista to co-founder and how the company chose the franchise model, the keys to success in managing people and leading them in this framework 
the value of self-awareness, love in the workplace, and so much more. This is truly a packed episode full of a lot of lessons from someone who has gone through pretty much everything that you could think about going through as a coffee business owner. I guarantee you, you're going to be enriched by the failures and successes that Mike talks about uh, experiencing through the years at Big B Coffee. And so with that, here now is my interview with the co-founder of Big B Coffee, Mike McFall. Well, Mike, so glad to have you on the show. Uh, how are you today? Uh, doing great. It's a uh, it's a good day. It's snowing here, uh, which is exciting. So no, things are things are awesome today. Thanks. Well, it, it really is an uh, honor to welcome you to the show, and um, your reputation precedes you. And Big B certainly is uh, such an inspiration to so many. And we're going to dive deep into uh, the story of Big B and your own journey. Uh, in this conversation, um, you outline a lot of this in uh, your new book, Grind, and um, I, I think we're going to cover a lot of stuff that you also include in the book in our conversation. But uh, let's take it back to the beginning of your journey, because it's such an interesting path that you took from barista to, um, you know, owner and, and you know, kind of the, uh, right from the beginning, it, it's an interesting thing that I don't think a lot of baristas can say <laughs> has happened to them. So how did you begin your coffee career uh, with Big B? Well, you know, my, my entree into coffee was, you know, I, I was on a, a, a very specific research project in East Lansing uh, at Michigan State University, and it was 20 hours a week. And so I thought it, I've always been intrigued by and, and love the concept of, of the coffee shop. And, and so I went to every, every coffee shop in the greater Lansing area and applied to be a barista. I thought it'd be a, a fun way to make a little extra money and, and, uh, and, and have a job that I enjoyed. So that's how I found my way into coffee. I started as a barista at our very first store. Uh, we had one store at that point. And I did the opening shift Monday through Friday. So I would, I would get there at, you know, 5.30 and we'd open at six and I would run the uh, floor uh, till two. And then I would leave, go over to the university and work on my project and then I'd go home. So, you know, that, that's how I entered coffee. And, you know, frankly, what happened to me is a couple of things. I, uh, one, I love the business. I, you know, I love being a barista. And, you know, there's some magic uh, to being a barista that's hard to explain. But, you know, when you see people every single morning, <laughs> day in and day out, you, you really build a relationship with them and, and you have this opportunity to engage them and you, you, you know, you, you really get to know them. And, and I love that part of it. And I loved the, the business of making people happy. And that's what we were in the business of. And that's what we're in the business of today. So one, I love the business, but two, I really sensed an opportunity from two perspectives. One, the industry, it didn't take a rocket scientist to see what was coming. This is the mid nineties. You know, it didn't take a rocket scientist to see, to, right, to, scientists to see what was coming, you know? And so, so one, I started to sense an opportunity from, an, from the industry's perspective, but then finally um, my business partner was doing something very different in coffee than anybody else was. And that also made me intrigued by the opportunity. And so he, I, you know, I obviously uh, worked for him and, and, uh, and then we ended up forming a company together. Uh, and that's the company that we've used to grow the concept. Big Peacock. Well, okay. So th there's a lot there because, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you must've been a good employee, first of all. Uh, and second, to be able to just enter into that and be a, become a partner of a business, like tangibly speaking, like after the conversation, what do you what do you do to just say, okay, well, you're no longer a barista, now you're a partner of the business. What what took place there? Well, you know, I had a conversation this morning. I was uh, I was on a, a student of mine. Uh, actually, I, I teach here at the university, and a student of mine does a podcast, and, and I was being interviewed by him, and and he had a question a similar type question and I said you know I think one of the keys was that well a I got really lucky <laughs> let me be clear about that I got really lucky to uh, have the business partner that I have and to be introduced to him and you know and, and but then you know I was really patient I mean I didn't push that aggressively I mean we how it came about frankly was uh, my business partner and his wife uh, at the time were building a second store I worked with Mary uh, every morning and she said to Bob, Hey, I think, I think you want to talk to this, this Mike guy 
uh, you know, I think may, he might be a candidate to help us manage the second store. And so Bob and I went to sit down in sort of a formal interview type setting. And, you know, within about three minutes, uh, we jumped up. It was a beautiful spring day. Uh, we jumped up and we ended up uh, going for like a four hour walk uh, that afternoon. And at the end of that walk is where we shook hands and agreed that we were going to form a new company to develop the concept Bigby Coffee. We didn't actually form that company for another 15 months. So I did leave my position at the university, uh, the research position. I became the assistant manager of our first store. And then when the second store opened, I became the general manager of the second store. And then what would it have been? eight months after that store opened is when we actually formed the company, the management company uh, that we own today, that we manage the business with today and as equal partners. And so it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, an instantaneous process. I mean, it, it, it took a while to put it all together. And, you know, frankly, that company didn't have any value for a long time. We, we didn't even really know what we were doing with it at first. Then we ended up in the conversation about franchising and then we started franchising and then that's the company that we use to franchise the concept big because okay so that's really fascinating and you obviously have had uh you resonated with one another and your values were similar obviously so what what is it that resonated and what uh from that translated into the mission and driving force behind big b coffee well I think what resonated for Bob and I is that we both did it, whatever it is, <laughs> we did it unconventionally. And, you know, we didn't play the game by the rules that everybody else thought they had to play the game by. And so that is a, that is something that we, we were kindred spirits of sorts. We always felt like there was a different and better way to do it. Uh, whatever it is. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not saying business. I'm not saying coffee. I'm, I'm basically saying all of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a different and better way to do it. And, and so we ended up, uh, you know, obviously working very, very well together. And we still work. I just, I hung up two seconds before this, uh, coming off a call with him on a pretty important topic that we're working on. And, you know, it's, uh, it, the, the thing that I think is important to understand is that each one of us, both of us, I, you know, the question I get asked all the time is, is come on, that co-CEO thing can't be real, right? Like you guys really aren't co, I mean, that, how does that work? And, you know, I think that, that one of the things that we always do is both of us wake up every single day and try to bring value to the organization and, and bring value to the organ, value to the organization or bring value to each other. Uh, and then there's a high degree of respect uh, between the two of us. And, you know, we treat our business partnership very much like a marriage. I mean, it is, uh, you know, the, there's that degree of communication. There's that degree of openness. Uh, there's that degree of caring. You know, I've always said it's like a, a, biz, a business partnership is is as you know, interesting, as difficult, as exciting and as a marriage. But you don't have the upside of the hanky panky. <laughs> Uh, that is very interesting because there is so much on the line when it comes to um, just about the size of your organization now. But at the time, you know, you'd only had uh, the couple of locations or two or three. At, how many locations did you have actually before you decided to franchise? Two. Two locations. So it's, you know, you're starting from this uh, foundation of, of values where you're trying to add value. And then comes the thing that I've, I've heard you talk about a lot, which is love in the workplace. And so obviously you're motivated to do business based on a mutual respect and care for your business partner and the organization, but then describe exactly what you mean by love in the workplace and how that translates to what you all did in the early years. Well, I think it's important to understand that this has been an evolution. And I think there was a real epiphany um, for Bob and I, that, you know, the way we treated each other, the respect we brought to each other, how we supported each other in building lives that we love, we needed, it's, it, there was a point in time when we realized that we needed to have those same 
we needed to treat our people the same way. And we didn't always. And the, the, you know, the first, you know, 15, 17 years of this company, it was not a healthy place. And, you know, we've come to come to terms with that. Uh, we've talked a lot about it. Um, there's been a fair amount, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, for good or for, for better or for worse, there's been a, been a fair amount of discussion and, and a fair amount of articles written about the transition um, from, you know, sort of the maniacal um, relationship that we had with our employees, uh, you know, 10 years ago, and then what it's transitioned to into to today, today. And, you know, we are um, really advocates uh, become powerful advocates of the concept of that organizations need to be in the future organizations will need to be deliberate deliberately developmental organizations meaning that that when somebody enters your world you as a leader and you as an organization you have a responsibility to support them nurture them take care of them provide them what they need uh, build an environment where they're continuously growing and learning and 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 that's going to be the expectation and to me that's the definition of love and and when when you are fully committed to supporting somebody else and pursuing their passions and developing a life that they love that is that's the definition of love and that's what we're that's what we're doing and it is it has been a powerful journey uh, it's been, we're six years into it now. And, um, yeah, I got to tell you, I love waking up every day. I love doing what I do, uh, now, uh, because of that environment that we're creating in the culture that we're, um, nurturing. How do we, how do we get to that place? So from your own experience in, we should say a maniacal way of management and leadership. And I imagine many people might be doing that now, but not even realizing it uh, in, in maybe they just inherited a particular framework for, for leadership. What were your thoughts when you were doing that style of leadership in, in really what was the catalyst for making the change? Cause I imagine there were some things that were working in were positive as like the ROI for different stores and things like that during those 10 years. Um, but there had to be something that sort of tipped the scale and say, you know what, this ha needs to change. And I wonder what that is. A couple things come to mind. Um, you know, before yeah, many of those years were about survival. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't want to, um, when you're in survival mode, it, it is it is a different mentality. I, I don't think you need to be maniacal, but I think it's it's a lot uh, easier to justify being maniacal when you're in survival mode. And I think that's what we did, frankly, is we justified our behavior because we were just trying to make it to you know next month or next quarter or whatever it might be, and you know that was earlier on. I always had these really sort of traditional views around people that worked within the organization. And I, I personally had a big, thick brick wall built up between me as a person and me as a manager of the business. And I didn't really let people cross that, that wall. And then I remember, this is one of the things that happened for me, was that I remember looking at one of the gentlemen that works in our company and a guy had worked for us probably for a decade or longer. Yeah, it would have been 13, 14 years at that point. And I remember looking at him and thinking, he's going to be around forever, <laughs> right? Like this guy's going to be, this guy is going to be in this organization until he retires. And then I remember thinking, this is one of the primary relationships of my life, this guy. And I am putting up this huge brick wall between him and I, and why am I doing that? And, and that realization was one of the things that really helped me. It's like, no, these people are important to me as a human being, as a person. They're not, they're not just employees that show up to work and do a job. I mean, I love this guy. I, I you know, went to visit him in the hospital uh, when his daughter was born. I, you know, like, this guy's really important to me. And, and, but yet, I still had this really big emotional wall built between the two of us. And that was that realization uh, that of how important that relationship was to me is one of the things that really propelled me forward into a new way of thinking. 
So taking your own realization and then translating that into the operations and the the framework of the business, what was that like? How did you take the steps to um, disseminate that into you know the culture? And there must have been some a, a lot of things that needed to be undone that were done and, and retranslated, et cetera. How did that go? Well, it's still going. <laughs> still for sure going. <laughs> I, you know, and and I you know I think. The thing that I think most people are not aware of or privy to is things take a really long time. Mm. And, you know, so, so we are, we're six years into this journey of finding our purpose, creating this vision. And then, you know, our purpose is to support you in building a life that you love. If you come into contact with our organization, we will, support you in building a life that you love, right? That is, that is what we are doing as a company. And then, and then our vision is to improve workplace culture in the United States. Mm -hmm. Settling, settling on those two things right there took us 24 months. We met every Tuesday at one o'clock. We had a consultant uh, that walked us through the process, but the leadership team met every Tuesday at at one o'clock for two years. And that's a long time. And I'll tell you what, though, when we got to the end of it, everyone in the organization believed in what we were talking about and what we were doing. And a lot, and there was a lot of arguing. Uh, there was a lot of, of dissent, discussion around it. Uh, but in the end, we all felt great about it because, you know, as a franchise company, it's really, you know, one of the core tenets of a franchise is supporting people in building profitable businesses, which will in turn support them in building the lives that they love. So, I mean, it really fit with the business model. Um, you know, our, 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 our coffee, like coffee to me is such a cool product. Like, you know, you get to like hand somebody a smile every morning and, and just that engagement and that, that energy that you get to exchange in the morning uh, when you make somebody that cup of coffee, that's supporting that person and building a life that they love. And, and it, and it keeps going in terms of our employees and, and the baristas and, and so on. So, you know, but I think the biggest thing that people underestimate is how long this stuff takes. And so, you know, we're six years in and we have a pretty robust program now, but we're running into stuff constantly that we're still continuing to have to improve and tweak and change and, uh, and make better. And I don't think that'll ever end, uh, frankly, but you know, it's a long, long process. That's a good word. And a lot of us are somewhat impatient with change because we are personally convinced, like you are personally convinced of the, uh, the rightness of the next steps for the company, but then there's other people to think of (laughs) and other minds and hearts to change. And, and, uh, it seems like if I were in those meetings, like but at the end of two years of dedicated meetings, I would start to really believe you <laughs> that you wanted to change. You think, you know? Yeah. You know, and, and I'll tell you one of the things that, um, that we did early is compensation was an issue in our organization. So we set up a task force to address that. And after a lot of work, uh, they came to us and brought us the, um, a solution uh, and, you know, Bob and I went into that meeting where they were presenting that to us and we agreed that we would just accept whatever they brought to us. <laughs> nice. And that we knew that, you know, we knew, uh, they'd put a ton of work into it and, and we knew it was going to be reasonable and so on. And, um, but that was, you know, that was one of the early things that we did to build trust around the fact that we were you know, we were going to, we were going to walk the talk. Yeah. Great. Walking the talk. And that's how people let, that's how people see your values in action. And they trust those values because a lot of us have mission statements and values statements and stuff printed. Uh, but when you know, your staff especially cannot see that walked out in the minutia of the day to day life of coffee business, which is plentiful, <laughs> um, they, they, they don't believe it. And so, yeah, I imagine, especially in the size you are now, like walking that out across all the franchises and everything else is such a monumental task. Um, I'm, I'm curious about choosing the franchise model 
as a as a vehicle for your company. Um, what led you to choose that model? Because you could have just proliferated stores, you know, in, in a traditional model, but uh, franchising seems like an interesting path. Why choose that one so early on? Well, I think a lot of it was out of necessity. And so, you know, I could paint some, some really uh, sort of beautiful picture about how, you know, we're, we're teachers at heart and, you know, we, I can, I can come up with a, a pretty, um, robust story around that. But I think, <laughs> frankly, the, the, the real answer to the question is, is necessity. And we were capital restrained. And we had people calling us and saying, do you franchise? Uh, are you a franchise? Where's your home? Where's your home office based out of? I'd like to learn more. And, you know, it didn't take that many of those phone calls for us to think, I wonder if we should consider this franchising model. And then we were really fortunate to have a woman by the name of Mary Ellen Sheets who founded Two Men in a Truck uh, in our hometown. Mm. And so we reached out to her and sat down with her and talked to her about franchising. And she was a huge advocate of franchising, right? So she was really very positive about the model and how good it had been for her and how rewarding and fulfilling it was uh, to support people in building businesses. And so, so she was a, a big advocate of franchising. And, you know, so I think that was also a big part of us feeling good about the decision. And it's been a great decision for us because I think naturally Bob and I are better in the role of, of mentor, coach, teacher than we are manager. <laughs> mm, okay. And, and so, and that's, that's really what a franchise is, you know, I mean, the, a franchise is about uh, mentoring and coaching and, and uh, facilitating growth. Uh, and, and really, it's not, it's not managing the franchise owner, you don't manage it, that man, the franchise owner manages themselves. And so it's a, it's a really, I think it's a great, you know, and I think the other thing about franchising that never gets talked about that I think should get talked about more is that when you're a franchise owner within a system, you have the community as a whole, as a resource as well. And so today, if a franchise owner has a problem, has some issue they're facing, you know, COVID was a great example. I mean, our response to COVID was so spot on and, and, and so well managed because of our franchise owners, you got the collective wisdom of you know, we have 240 franchise owners now, and you have the collective wisdom of 240 people who have their life savings on the line, who have an incredibly vested interest, who are willing to go all in with you, right? Mm. Uh, and so, and then also as a franchise owner, you have that same community to tap. And, and so it's not just about the relationship between my organization and the franchise owner, it's the, rela it's the relationship between all of the franchise owners. And how powerful that is. And the collective wisdom of the group is, I mean, it's amazing. Well, that's an excellent point. It's uh, one that I hadn't really thought of. And because when you think about franchising, I think you automatically have negative associations with franchise. I think most people just think about McDonald's or fast food and it kind of it turns them off to the idea unless they were as fortunate as, as you to have a good mentor to usher them into the idea of franchising. Um, in, a, in a positive light. But um, yeah, I mean, when you're talking about these folks as managers of their own spaces and leaders in their own right, um, I wonder what it means or what it looks like to, well, uh, hire them. Essentially, that it, they, not just anybody can be a franchise owner. I imagine they have to meet a certain set of criteria. And I also imagine that that set of criteria has changed over the years, as you were just describing how you operated in the beginning versus the last six years. So I wonder if you might talk a little bit about how you select or uh, approve people to do the franchise, to run the franchise, and how that's evolved over the years. There's the sort of uh, well-polished uh, sort of public relations answer to that question. <laughs> And then there's there's the real answer to that question, right? And you know, I like to to go with the real answer, which is you can't know. Hmm. And 
you know, the, if you're a if you're a huge organization and you've got you know four thousand data points uh, that you're working from, there might be a way to plug all of the personality profiles of all four thousand data points into some kind of a uh, personality testing and come out with some answers, right? But I'll tell you what. I am regularly amazed at how wrong I am about predicting who's going to be a strong franchise owner and who isn't. And so, you know, I, I have judgment. Everybody has judgment. So, you know, somebody new will come into the system and, you know, a good example, a friend of mine approached me. He was very successful in the technology business and, and he wanted to uh, build a, a store for his daughter. And I was, I was adamant. You know, I told him, I said, you know, you can't, it's not going to work. I mean, she's got it, it. The only way this would work is if she came to you with the idea and it was her thing. And she, you know, and she was, you know, was pressing you to do it. Like you can't take it to her, right? Like mm. it, 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 as a, as a, a way to solve her problems, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I still believe that to some degree, you know, and uh, well, anyway, he, he ignored me and he did it anyway. He had full faith in his daughter. And she's been unbelievable. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she really has been unbelievable. Like she is just rock solid and she is so good at it. And, you know, and then there have been times, uh, you know, where we, we bring somebody into our system who is, uh, has a proven track record in another concept and, you know, or, or, you know, you just have all the faith and confidence in the world that they're going to be great and they're terrible, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, the the fact of the matter is, you know, you if you think that you can predict whether someone's going to be successful in the business or not, you're fooling yourself. And and you know that is so so we don't spend an enormous amount of time on that topic because you know who who am I to judge whether you can can step into our mechanism and make it work or not. I mean, there's some fundamentals. I mean, like you got to, you got to run the store for 12 months with an apron on out front, working the floor six hours a day. To me, that's a fundamental. Like we're not going to take, you know, if, if four doctors wanted to put the money together and invest in this, building a couple of stores and hire a manager to run that, we would not accept that. Okay. Like that is not, you know, so, so there, there are, and, and that, you know, to me, that provision in our contract that requires the franchise owner to be on the floor with an apron on six hours a day that is one of the smarter things we ever did. Was that something from the beginning that is still true? Yeah. Yeah. I think they might be talking about taking it out. I, I got to look into it. There was a, I heard a conversation a couple of weeks back. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so, so, you know, um, but again, you know, I, 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 the, there is the, the, the um, it is very hard to predict whether somebody is going to be successful in the business or not. So now you have all of these uh, locations and you've got a lot more brand recognition today than you did in the early years. And so I imagine there's a lot of people that are a little bit more like people can see the values on display now and they can say, you know, that, yeah. that really resonates with me. Maybe I can do that. So maybe you have more qualified candidates today than you did back then. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think that's, that was the answer I gave, which is, you know, we're also, we've also been very, very good at, always been very good at setting the right expectation and making sure that people are coming with a reasonable expectation in relation to how the business is going to perform. And so that, that was always one of our strengths uh, over the years. But yes, I think today, I think we are getting a, a, a more aligned I, I was going to say qualify, but that's not the right word. We're getting a more aligned uh, franchise applicant because we're so much more public with with our values and how we run the business, our purpose, and so on. So, speaking of running the business, when we mentioned, you know, somebody's doing an amazing job and then somebody's doing a poor job. In some ways, as you're a mentor, you're coaching people, et cetera, you're also, in a sense, managing them because you've got to do something about what you hear is happening at a franchise location where somebody's doing a very bad job. Like, let's take us into hypothetically, if somebody's doing a bad job and you need to, it needs to be addressed, how does that get addressed by the company? Well, what we've always prescribed to is the carrot. And highlighting 
those that are doing it very, very well. And that is, that is a different mentality in franchising. So oftentimes, you know, uh, so we, we've, uh, we're just in the last two years, uh, we're just now starting to send out compliance letters. I think a lot of franchisors would fall over dead thinking that we've got it <laughs> to the size we have and how long we've been around. We've never sent out a compliance letter, but we've never sent a compliance letter. And, you know, it, it is, it's that the idea is, is show, show the way that works, demonstrate that it does work, coach people through getting to the results through good execution and, you know, jumping up and down on people because they're not doing a good job doesn't, that does not make them improve. I know that is for sure. It mm. just doesn't. And so, you know, we are, um, we have hard conversations with people, right? Like people need to know that they're, they're underperforming or, you know, something they're doing in the store is inappropriate, but there's a way to have that conversation that's respectful you know, with dignity and you can have that conversation and have the person walk away feeling okay about it. Feeling like it was meant from a place of caring. And, and I think, you know, that's something that my partner and I have just naturally been very, very good at. Um, and it's, it's not, you know, and, and it's not something that you, I mean, I, I suppose you can learn how to do it, but there's sort of, you know, leaders who have empathy and, you know, we walk into stores and we understand how hard it is to run a freaking store, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, and so, so I think that's, that's really the answer to that question. How do you deal with somebody? We've always dealt with the carrot, not the stick is the really short answer to that question. That's good. Well put. And uh, yep, good positive reinforcement of values. Uh, it, it sounds like something that also works in the microcosm of the store within the store, like the manager to barista yeah, yeah, totally. as well. So it sounds like that kind of mentality is, is something that's through the organization, something that works very well for you. And I, I would say that it's probably something that works well for everybody if they do it the right way. Um, so when we're talking about the, um, the positive examples, I mean, I wonder what the hallmarks are of a really successful franchise. And in, when you can look at the example, example of like, this is a great Big B location because, because what? Well, you know, they follow the system, you know, and that, is, that is tried and true. And if you call, you know, our top 20 operators, every single one of them is going to say, just follow the system. And, you know, that can, that can sound arrogant by me because I created the system. But what you have to understand is, is there has been, there have been, you know, 200 operators who've been adding value to that system for a long, long time. Right. So it's not me anymore. I mean, that system is now been worked and reworked and vetted and improved by some really, really, really smart people who are running stores day in and day out. And the system is freaking awesome. Okay. And it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it is uh, that 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 is the number one answer you would get from any one of our, our successful franchise owners is. You know, don't, don't, what I tell people is for two years, just practice and get really good at executing the system. At the end of two years, after you've been through two annual cycles, you've been through two Augusts, you've been through two Januaries, then you know what, at that point, I want your opinion. But until you've been through two years, I don't, I don't want to hear from you, <laughs> right? Mm, okay. Because a lot of, a lot of the things that we do and the systems we have in place are going to make sense to you after two years. And so, uh, and then the other thing that I believe in completely is a positive outlook and being enthusiastic, right. And being energetic and engaged. Like to me, I don't know. I don't know any successful entrepreneurs, operators who don't have a, a very optimistic uh, enthusiastic outlook. It, it is, you know, and so, and I'll tell you, I, I could, 
45, we used to have 45 day calls, my partner and I would with every owner. So after they were open 45 days, and I, I probably had a hundred of those over the years, right? And I, I wish I would have predicted. I wish I would have set the phone down and written next to their name, gonna succeed, gonna fail. Because the attitude at the end of 45 days was you you had you had your your owners who were down in the mouth, downtrodden, exhausted, tired, exasperated. And then you had the owner operators who were also tired and exasperated, but you knew they had a positive attitude and they believed in the business and they were showing up every day and bringing that positive energy to the store. That is what is absolutely critical. And, you know, when that turns to negative, it's a really difficult process to bring it back. So what is it that... A kind of two part question here. Uh, one is basically what the foundations, what you would consider the foundations of that system that, that are key for them. Uh, and then are they the same things that they, if they're going to buck up against that, you know, it, are those the same things? Like if they get kind of antsy and, and want to, you know, contact you and you don't want, you don't want to hear from them, but they're just like, oh, I don't know about this. Um, so what, what are the foundations of those, that system that really make it work? Well, I, I mean, Chris, I could talk about this for four hours. <laughs> uh, it is my business. It's it's everything, right? Uh, these systems in the retail store are so critical to everything we do. But I think fundamentally, you have to understand that my business partner came out of the high volume restaurant business. And the systems he put in place in our coffee shops are systems and it's an approach of running a high volume kitchen, not running a coffee shop. And it is a, it's a different mentality and there's a different way of executing. And so what we've done is we've established our espresso bar like it is a, a series of line cooks in a breakfast restaurant. And everyone, so so we've we've, and it's just a prioritization methodology, right? So when you're assigned to the cashier, you have your A level, your B level, your C level responsibilities. When you're the shop puller, you're the milk steamer, right? So so that tool right there is mind-blowingly powerful. But that tool doesn't deal with anything from an attitudinal perspective. And so we also have written what we call our operating philosophy, which is our expectation of anybody working inside of a Big B coffee attitudinally. And so, and it's got four points. And what we tell people when they start with us is, is if everything you do falls within one of these four points, you never have to question whether you're successful as an employee here or not, because you are. And right there, those two things take on the two most difficult challenges that any manager of any business faces. I'll ask, I do a presentation and I've done this presentation, you know, hundreds of times over the years, which is it's a prospective franchise owners. And I'll ask, what's the number one issue that you face as a business owner? And I said, oh, by the way, it has been the number one issue faced by business owners for the last 30, 50, 70 years. Invariably, no doubt somebody yells out people, right? People, <laughs> managing people, right? And, and it's the mentality of just about anybody, business owner or not, in relation to what's difficult, difficult about running a business. Well, what we've created, the two tools we've created, are the tools that take on and solve that most difficult challenge. And I mean, I could keep going. So, so you know, it, the thing is, is most people have this mentality that employees aren't good, right? They're difficult. They're challenging. They don't have a work ethic, so on and so forth. What I'm here to tell you is, is there's nothing wrong with people. We just have a whole bunch of really bad managers out there. Mm, wow. what, a man, what a manager needs to do is set the expectation, give them the tools that they need to be successful in their job, and then follow through and support them in both of those. And if you do that, I promise you, your people will thrive. And, and so to me, that these are the systems we're talking about. Of course, we have a system for 
everything. Right? Like mm -hmm. we are, a, we're a systems driven company, but, but like, to me, those two are the big ones. Right. And, and I've, I've just, it's been reinforced so many times over the years. Uh, and and the, when, when one of our franchise owners says, follow the systems, they're not talking about how to fill a mop bucket. They're talking about perk, this, this operating philosophy, right? They're talking about position priorities. Those are the systems that they're, that they're talking about. That's a really great point on management, especially, and it's, something we've said on the show a lot that we guess manage, managers are the most powerful position in the coffee retail space since they're the present authority and they are the conductors of what happens in the shop, both between the ears of all the people that are there and um, with the interaction between them and the customers. And it, it just is really, um, it's fascinating to just kind of watch ownership and, and maybe this is something else to, to talk about, that ownership has the mentality that is hard to find good people. As you mentioned, it's always people problems. But be, getting that self-awareness to realize that it's actually coming from the top down and not the other way is hard fought for. And it's something that it's encouraging to see how in the last six years you all have exemplified self-awareness in this process of kind of changing the culture uh, and going through that process. And I wonder if, I mean, do you see that with the franchise owners as self-awareness being a key factor to being able to have that be just a shared value amongst those within the store? In my book, um, Grind, I make an argument that you aren't the most important ingredient in new, in your new business. Your self-awareness is. Mm. <laughs> and because you, you might actually be a detriment to your business in many ways, right? And being aware of that and then figuring out how to counter your behavior so that you aren't a detriment to your business is a really, really difficult proposition. Most people don't want to admit that they aren't perfect, right? Especially people that have built successful businesses. I mean, they think they're perfect, <laughs> right? They think, <laughs> and so you know, if you've been able to build a successful business, but but you're probably you know at every stage of the business, you need to be a new and different person, and you need to bring whatever the business needs today as the leader. You need to bring that, and as the business grows and evolves, the you are. Um, what you need to bring changes and maybe at certain stages of the growth of the business you aren't very good at that or that's not your strong suit or and you need to be aware of that and then you need to figure out how to overcome that right so you know to me that awareness piece you know and i i could talk about awareness for oh i love i, I just love the subject uh, but you know the thing the thing is is Awareness is not about you understanding and mitigating your reactions to situations. Awareness is about you understanding your impact on others. And that's that inner, that interpersonal uh, engagement at the store level between a manager and a barista or between an owner and a manager. You have to understand how you're impacting the environment and then therefore impacting other people, right? And it's really hard to get those insights when you're the boss because no one wants to bring you that bad news. Everybody's scared to. Yeah, good point. The door is always open, doesn't always work <laughs> if people are afraid to come in. Right. Um, and their customers also obviously are experiencing the, um, uh, experiencing the results of that kind of dynamic, that relational dy dynamic, because they can sense when something is wrong behind the bar if there's tension between ownership and uh, management and, and the baristas, it's palatable. Yeah. You know, and, and the thing that, that we've really stressed to our owners is that you need to give tools to your managers for them to communicate to the staff and the baristas about behavior that isn't ideal. And that's difficult for a manager. How do you communicate a certain behavior isn't appropriate? But if you can, if you can couch that inside of, like that's what 
in my, you know, that's what the position priorities and perk our operating philosophy. That's what they do is, is you can, you provide the manager the ability to take certain behaviors and within the context of these systems, explain why that behavior is inappropriate. Yeah. And also, like you said, just the reinforcing what behaviors are appropriate and, and right. desirable. So in today's economy, in today's landscape of retail, uh, so much, you have so much influence and you, your organization is, uh, growing. And so I, I wonder how do you plan to, uh, scale and also deliver these kind of values as you do so in kind of this tumultuous landscape of, of retail amidst COVID. And I mean, what are, what are your next steps as a company, uh, as we talk about where you've come from and where you are today? Well, I think, you know, you, you hit on something really important, and that is, you know, for us to grow, you know, we need to continue to bring, no, we need to get better at bringing the values to our franchise owners and to the people within the organization. You know, and today, you know, we have thousands of baristas and, and we want to, um, we really want to bring them all the work we're doing in relation to our purpose, which is supporting you and building a life that you love. And so one of the things, and there's a lot, there's a lot of different things going on, but one of the things that we're doing is we put together a curriculum. It's called the life you love uh, curriculum, and it is four courses. And those courses are uh, each one of those is related to a foundational element that we've defined uh, in relation to building a life that you love. And so right now, I mean, what we're in the middle of right now is, taking those courses to our world internally and getting our baristas involved in those courses and so on. Uh, you know, and, and then there's the other thing that we're doing is we provide individualized coaching to everyone in our company. So when you work within our organization, you have, you're assigned a coach and you meet with that coach on a monthly basis. And that coach has nothing to do with your day job that coach is about supporting you and pursuing your passions, supporting you and building a life that you love. And you know what, in the end, that might mean you leave our company to go pursue your passion. And I promise you, if that happens, you're going to get a high five on the way out the door and we're going to support you in the best way we can to make that happen for you. And, you know, that is, that's unconventional thinking. You know, most managers, you'd, you'd mentioned earlier that people will say it's, it's about, it's hard to find good people. And, and, and I, and I, I get, red in the face, angry with that statement. Mm -hmm. That is such an assumption that people suck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And I hate that. But but you know what, it's not about finding good people. It's about creating an environment that you bring somebody into that allows them to thrive. Mm -hmm. That's what leadership is. And, and 90, my, my take is 98.75% of people want to thrive. They want to be successful. They walk into an organization and the management and leadership of that organization lets them down. And so what we need to do is create environments where people come in and we support them in thriving. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're working so hard at. Uh, and, you know, it's a, this whole thing is one big grand experiment, but I'll tell you what, we love showing up to work every day and doing it. Uh, I really appreciate your heart for this and, and for your people. It's truly uh, encouraging and inspiring for all of us who have influence in the lives of those working in, in shops and, um, uh, more power to you. I hope that that continues that, that process continues to flourish. And um, I, I really appreciate you taking time to join us on the show. Can you talk about where we can find your book and just stay in touch with what you all have going on? Oh, sure. I mean, Bigby.com is is the uh, Bigby is the mothership for sure. Uh, and but you know the social media handles. Um, find me on LinkedIn. If you put Mike McFall and Big B, I, I should come up and that's probably the best one, uh, the best place uh, to connect. But I also have a, a website, grindthebook.com. Uh, and I'm in the, I'm still developing content on there, but uh, that's also a place that you can connect with me. Excellent. And we'll certainly link to those in the show notes. Mike, it's really been wonderful to talk with you again. Thank you for joining us on the show. Really appreciate this conversation. Oh, my pleasure, Chris. It's been great to be here.
Well, I hope that you really enjoyed that episode. I, for one, of course, you can kind of predict where I really resonated with this conversation in the self-awareness aspect, especially Mike's firm hatred for the idea that, you know, it's hard to find good people and the emphasis that he put on management and leading through self-awareness. All of these things echo stuff that we've talked about on Keys to the Shop a lot and is evident that no matter the size of your business, whether you have 250 plus locations across the country or just one or two spots in your hometown, the importance of leading with self-awareness and creating uh, uh, an environment for success and lifting people up through your leadership is a universal factor to being successful and being fulfilled as a, a coffee entrepreneur. And so a uh, big thank you to Mike McFall for taking time to talk with us here at Keys to the Shop. We really appreciate you, Mike. And I would encourage you all to go out and get his book, Grind. We'll have links in the show notes for that as well as uh, links to Big B Coffee. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about this episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, just send an email to me, chris at keys to the shop.com. And of course, that's also the email address where you can inquire about Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. And with that, that is the end of our episode today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me in this Founder Friday. And I hope you have an amazing weekend. Thank you again. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.